So I found the culprit. With the help of the thermal camera and my nose, it actually wasn't too hard to find. This is the coil for the relay, or the contactor, that turned on the spindle motor. I don't know too much about these things, so I don't know if this thing is, you know, 50 years old and will be impossible to find, or if it's sort of like a commodity item. What I've done is just pulled the same coil out of the contactor for the coolant pump and simply use that to replace this coil. So until I find another coil or replace the whole contactor, the milling machine, you know, the spindle and the rapids work, I just won't have coolant. I regret not having gotten a shot of the other good coil just to show you the difference, but this one is basically toasted. I don't think I was pushing my machine any harder than I usually do. Here are the chips I was getting. Maybe it was just old and its time was up. Anyway, we were milling the 10 degree angle into what will become the bottom face of the body of the fly cutter when the spindle just stopped on me. And for those of you that asked, no, I didn't run into my jaws. Although I did have the foresight to keep this corner of the hex up above the top of the jaws, I don't know if you could see that, but once that was cleaned up, I would have still been about, I don't know, 60 thou above those jaws. It turns out though that I am too low. We'll see it in a minute, but once I face this off, the next step will be to cut the channel for the high speed steel and the step ahead of it to receive the grub screws that hold it in place. And in order to cut that, I'm gonna need at least another half inch of material up out of my vise. So I'm gonna pick that up now before I finish the top. That way the, you know, trying to pick up the same angle isn't necessary. I'll pick that up and we'll get back to cutting in the features that'll mount the high speed steel blank. So I've put the lighting on this to try to accentuate the pattern that the face mill has left. But you can see since my face mill isn't wide enough to take this all in one cut, there's a transition in the surface finish between, you know, the first cut going right to left and then the return cut that just picked up that last half inch or so in the back. Now I also have either one or more dull inserts or an insert on this face mill hanging a little bit low because I can see just some scratches that it's leaving behind. With fresh inserts properly installed and the correct feed and speed for this, I know that this face mill can leave a, you know, not a mirror finish, but a lot better than what you're looking at here. And of course, if you could do this in one pass with a large enough face mill to cover the entire workpiece, you know, you'd at least get a consistent surface finish all the way across it. And that's one of the big advantages of a fly cutter is you can adjust it to be larger than your work, you know, within the size of the fly cutter that you have to potentially do things, you know, in one finish pass. They don't move as much material as a face mill, but the surface finish potentially could be much more consistent. So next up, I wanna cut the channel that will accept the high speed steel. So I'm gonna cut a half inch wide by half inch deep slot to accept this plank here. In addition to that slot, I'll need a step on the, let's call it the front side of it, in order to install two or three set screws to lock it in place. Before I actually cut the slot, let's talk about placement. Where on the bottom face of this fly cutter to install the tool steel blank. So in theory, you could install this blank almost anywhere on the face of this fly cutter. But with some forethought, you could minimize the amount of grinding you'd have to do to shape the tip to get the proper geometry to actually have it perform well. Typically on a fly cutter, I think it's safe to say you'd want either like a neutral cutting angle or a positive cutting angle, like a neutral or positive rake. Though again, it depends on the material you plan to use it on. But in order to minimize how much of that geometry you have to grind into the high speed steel blank, the tools are installed with the cutting edge coincident with the center line of the head. In my case, that would be point to point across the hex. Now this is a little hard to explain with hand waving here, so I think I'll probably throw up some overlays. Let's assume you grind no geometry into the tip of the high speed steel blank, and it's on center line. In that case, when the tool hits the work, it'll have zero rake. It'll be sort of right tangent to the circle that it's spinning in. If you move it up away from the center line, that makes the cutting more negative, I believe. You, you reduce the angle, like the attack angle that it makes when it hits the work. If you flip it to the other side of the center line, it'll make it more positive. It's the same exact geometry as the boring bars that we talked about in the boring head video. That said, since there will be some grinding happening, you know, to form the tip of the fly cutter blank, the high speed steel blank, I'm gonna put mine just about 10 thou ahead of the center line. 
because if I were to put it on center line and then grind the geometry, I'm technically removing high speed steel, and so I'm moving behind that line, giving it more positive rake. If that's a bit of a brain bender to follow, then just forget it. Install yours on center line if you plan to make one of these, and just grind whatever geometry you want into the tip positive, negative, or neutral based on the final position that tip is in, again, with relation to the work. This is just a bit of a hedging my bet. The last thing you'll want to keep in mind is which side of that center line you decide to install the high-speed steel bit on, right? I could cut the slot either on my side of the center line or the far side of the center line. What that's going to do is dictate which way you have to spin your fly cutter in order to actually cut anything. And the only reason that's important is some machines either might not have a spindle reverse or they might not have all the spindle speeds available when you do reverse it. Basically, you just want to make sure you're not making your fly cutter backwards. Now that said, I probably just jinxed myself and this will end up being backwards. But in my case, it's going to go on the back side of this line. The way it's installed now, it wants to spin counterclockwise in order to cut the material off this leading edge. Since this is the bottom, when it's installed, it'll spin clockwise to remove the material, and that's the direction that I want it to go. So let me go ahead and sink this into the fly cutter. So in real life, you would have wanted to keep that cut a lot cleaner than what you just saw here in this video. There were a lot of chips in that slot along with the end mill, and that's always not a safe thing to do. It's very important to keep from recutting chips, but in my case, the camera was in there so close, I was kind of afraid to give it a shot with the air gun. So that looks like it's a nice snug fit. It's going to take a little deburring to get this to seat all the way. Probably doesn't need to be this tight, but I think a couple of licks with a file should bring that in nicely. Next up, I need to create the shoulder, or the step here, that'll permit me to install the set screws to keep the high-speed steel blank in place. I think I'm going to go in with this shell mill cutter and try to do that all on one pass. Shell mills are really something else, aren't they? Next up, I'm going to drill three holes for the set screws. I'm just going to mark this out, center punch them by hand, drill them here in the mill, and then probably tap them over in the vise. So that more or less does it for, let's say, like the body of the fly cutter. Now I just need to attach the arbor. As I mentioned, this is tapered, so I'm going to have to turn it both cylindrical and to size for a press fit in the back. And I'm going to do that right here in the mill. Although this could be done in the lathe by holding it in the back, maybe in a collet chuck. It's threaded back there. And with a center up at the front. But how well this thing is actually made is anyone's guess. And doing it in the mill will ensure concentricity with the ISO taper side.
Holy mackerel. Did you see what I just saw? That's going right in the trash. I've got this other one from the same box. I have no idea of what it used to be, but it's got enough material left for me to still get the press fit that I wanted for the fly cutter head. I'm gonna take the end of this off at the saw and I'll set this back up. So that didn't work out exactly how I would have liked it to. I was shooting for like a one and a half thou to two thou interference and I'm essentially like line to line. It's probably only a couple of tenths. And although that's still technically a press fit, if I, you know, drive this into that hole, it's not going to have as much holding power, I don't think, as I would have liked it to. So I think I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go over to the press and just push this in the hole. That, I don't know if you can see that, the bore on the back side did break slightly through the slot for the high-speed steel. I might just open that up a little bit and just weld it from the bottom. Not enough to fit in the hole, but not enough to give me the warm fuzzies. So no sooner did I reach the press and I realized I had a 10 degree bottom, which makes pressing it a little complicated. So I hit the head with the torch and this dropped right in. And to be honest, once it cooled down, it felt pretty darn tight. I mean, that kind of thing is a little bit, I don't know, impossible to kind of figure out by hand, but I felt ever so slightly better about things. I did go in anyway and weld the bottom. Basically plug weld it through that little hole we saw earlier and filed it square again. I'm going to go hit this on the wire wheel. I may cold blue it and then I'll come back and we'll try it out. All right, so here it is. The black turned out meh, so-so, just like it always does. I've got some aluminum in here for now. It's larger than what my face mill could have done in one pass. And we'll give it a try with the fly cutter. Now I've got the whole tool bit installed in here. It's a little bit excessive. I just, you know, I'll probably cut it in half. But for now, I just want to test this thing out. The only thing I really did was give it a little bit of a nose radius and a few degrees of positive rake. The tool bit's already got, you know, sort of an off-cut angle in it. I just took advantage of that. The way it's set up, it's almost an 8-inch swing, 200 millimeters. I'm going to try this out at, I don't know, about 500 RPM and a fine feed rate. All right, well, I'm happy how that turned out. I mean, I realize aluminum maybe isn't the most worthy adversary, but we'll see this in the surface gauge build video up against some medium carbon steel. I expect it to perform just as well, but we'll see how it goes. The surface is spectacular. There's a little bit of a skip pattern. You probably won't be able to see it. It's running vertically the way I have it here. I realized I didn't grind any sort of back relief on the bottom of the tool. I only put positive rake on the front and sort of that fillet on the bottom, that small radius on the bottom. I would guess with a little bit more back relief, this sort of skip pattern would go away. Just to quickly address some of the questions about the fly cutter and why I built one when I have a face mill, well, as you can see, I can adjust this to clear quite a wide path, a lot wider than my face mill can do. And as I mentioned in the beginning, 
being able to do it in one pass gets a more consistent surface finish. There's no break in that surface finish where you kind of reverse and come back on the material after you've taken the first one or two passes, for example. In addition, it's high-speed steel, so it's got all the benefits of high-speed steel cutters. You can grind and shape it to whatever job you might have at hand. In my case, for example, with the indexable face mill, the inserts that I have are really just for steel. I would have to spend money on a whole new pack of inserts for, I guess, some high-rake, very sharp ground inserts specifically for aluminum. I mean, it does okay, but if I'm looking for a mirror finish, the inserts that I own wouldn't really pull off, you know, this kind of a finish. Well, I think that does it for the fly cutter build. I hope you enjoyed that, and thanks for watching.